Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Paola Hernandez and I am Food Policy and Project Officer at Healthcare Fat Farm Europe. I will be moderating this webinar and soon I will explain you the outline of today's meeting and introduce our speakers, Ian Stanton, Head of Sustainability at the Royal Liverpool and Road Green University in Hospitals NHS Trust, and David Irving, Communication and Public Affairs Manager at the European Vending and Coffee Service Association. Thank you both to be here with us today. I would like to remind you all uh, that you are muted. Um, if you have any questions, please use the chat box and we will address them after the presentation. I hope you have a fruitful debate about the benefits, opportunities and challenges of setting sustainability criteria in healthcare tenders for vending machines. So um, today um, we will present the Healthcare Without Harm's uh, recent publication on procuring vending machines in healthcare and provide guidelines for healthcare organizations to procure healthier and more sustainable vending services. Our first speaker, Ian, will introduce the um, wider that drivers for change in the NHS in England and also on some of the work they have done at his hospital. Afterwards, David will present what vending is, what they do in healthcare, some legislation on sustainability related issues and some good practices. So before we dive into our topic, I would like to give you a short introduce, introduction about who we are and what we do at HealthCode.com Europe. We are a non-for-profit membership organization of European hospitals, healthcare systems, healthcare professionals, local authorities, research and academic institutions, and environmental and health organizations that bring the voice of healthcare professionals to the European policy debate on diverse topics. And we also raise awareness and inform the healthcare sector about the importance of the environment and press healthcare leaders and professionals to advocate for broader societal policies and changes. As I previously mentioned, in the European office, we work on several policy areas, mainly the impact on pharmaceuticals on the environment and antimicrobial resistance climate smart healthcare, the importance of access to healthy and sustainable food services while reducing food waste, safe management of chemicals, and sustainable procurement. We work on these areas closely with our diverse network of more than 100 members across the European region. However, this is part of the global network of green and healthy hospitals that is made of more than 1,000 members representing 30,000 hospitals and healthcare facilities. I will strong, strongly encourage all the participants to join this committee if you are not part of it yet. So now I will introduce uh, Healthcare Towns Europe new publications about the sustainable procur public procurement of vending machines at healthcare. So why vending machines? Um, well, as you might have realized, uh, vending machines can be found in many public settings in Europe, including healthcare facilities. Yet, uh, this is an area of food services that is often overlooked. For this reason, we decided to gather evidence and provide guidelines for healthcare organizations that wish to procure healthier, more nutritious, and more sustainable vending machines. In general terms, uh, let's say that vending machines offer a convenient solution to provide staff, patients, and visitors with basic food options when it's not possible to run a um, fresh meal service. So let's take a look at some important aspects. Um, energy efficiency might not be the most relevant factor when procuring vending machines in Europe. 
just by the available technologies and legislation in place. Uh, but there are, however, uh, some options available to mitigate environmental impact and improve the energy efficiency of energy use through, for example, LED lighting. Also, vending machines often provide disposable utensils as well as packaging, creating additional non-recyclable waste, particularly plastic. To combat this, uh, some hospitals are already purchasing alternatives or establishing diverse strategies for their food service, including for their vending machines. It is recognized as well that the majority of vending machines, including those in hospitals, often stock packaged food and berries that are high in calories, sugar, saturated fat, and or sodium. These machines are usually positioned in high visible areas, uh, like an entrance and exit, and are sometimes the only food available on site. There are several measures that can actually influence consumers to, to choose healthier products. Um, and you can find actually more information about this on the fact sheet. But I just want to highlight that uh, research in this field is still pretty limited. And therefore, I think we still need to know more about how all of these factors actually influence our behavior and health. In terms of legislation, uh, procurement is a powerful tool to promote the uptake of healthier and more sustainable food practices. In the EU, the 2014 Procurement Directive encouraged public authorities to consider environmental impacts when making procurement decisions. Furthermore, the recently published green public procurement criteria for food and catering services aim to address the main environmental impacts of food and provide a common basis for developing procurement criteria for public contracting authorities. The EPP criteria for vending machines um, specifically focus on organic and or fair trade products and those using environmentally responsible vegetable plants. A specific criteria is also included for smart control, annual energy consumption, reusable parts, and purchasing vending machines. Health impacts are actually not specifically addressed in the GPP criteria. However, um, the provision of healthy products for pen machines is not mentioned. Other EU legislation such as eco design and energy labeling regulation that covers energy consumption, refrigerant, and disposal are also applied to vending machines and actually David will provide us some overview of this afterwards. In brief, uh, healthcare.com Europe um, believe that vending machines provided in healthcare facilities aim to offer healthier and more environmentally friendly choices. Therefore, we recommend the following actions. Uh, create a um, sustainable food policy and an action plan that address um, key issues in the food system affecting the health of individuals, communities, and the environment. Engage with suppliers to build a shared commitment to sustainability, food, and nutrition. Create a culture where sustainability is understood and becomes a priority amongst patients, staff, and external stakeholders. Um, share your experiences and encourage other institutions to create a healthier and more sustainable food policy. All these recommendations are actually based on our case studies. Uh, in Ireland, Spain, and United Kingdom. Um, the one in Ireland um, provide us, for example, some uh, lessons. Um, um, actually, it offers an excellent initiative for which we can learn that voluntaries 
system level or national policies do not always necessarily translate into action at an operational level. The case study in Spain uh, highlights the value of creating an organizational food policy that starts with a good understanding of the nutrition and hydration needs of employees and visitors. And um, the example of Sussex Community NHS Foundation Trust uh, evidence how simply offering healthier snacks um, it is not effective enough to drive change. Um, and it's also an example uh, that highlights the importance of supplier engagement in identifying and introducing new options and the potential for competitive tender processes to support long term impact. More information on this can be found on the fact sheet that I invite you all to read. Um, right now, I just want to pass the ball to Ian, uh, who will tell us more about his experience at the Royal Liverpool um, Brooklyn University Hospital and it's just that. Thanks, Maria. <clears throat> Can I um, can I put this slide on myself on? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So everyone can see the um, the first slide. Everyone can see now the first slides from um, from our my presentation. So welcome everybody. I'm just going to talk through some of the things that we've done here over the last few years and some of the drivers behind um, health and sustainability within healthcare within UK hospitals. So, um, Maria gave the very long title, which is our former hospital. We merged with some other hospitals very recently, so we're now a um, much bigger NHS trust. We have a budget of over £880 million, employ more than 13,000 staff, uh, and we merged, so Royal Liverpool and Broad Green Hospitals merged with Aintree Hospital just at the beginning of October. Um, so, we'll be working over the next few years to align our services because they're currently very different. In this presentation, I'll be talking about what we've done with Royal and Broad Green Hospitals. Within the UK, the guidance for hospitals really started with the Hospital Food Standards Panel Report. This was in August 2014, and it set out um, that all hospitals should have a food and drink strategy. You'll see on the case study on the right of this slide that Royal Liverpool was in the initial um, standards report due to the work that we've done with the hospital or external caterers for patient meals and our patient council, which is a group of um, group of patients and former patients who help to inform our services. we had already devised the healthy eating plan in 2013, so following this guidance in 2014, we produced our first hospital food and drink strategy um, in 2015. Um, this was updated again in 2017, um, and we were due to update our strategy in 2019, so every every two years. But at the moment, the hospital food standards are being rewritten, so we've paused our work so that we can align with the new the new system. In 2017, there was an update from the hospital food standards to say how compliance was um, being aligned with the original guidance. And it found that uh, not all hospitals did have a, a food and drink strategy, but it reiterated the 2014 findings. So that was that hospitals' food and drink strategies should consider nutritious food for patients, healthier food for staff and visitors, and sustainable food for all. Within our hospital, we were lucky that we already had groups that were responsible for those aspects. So our food and drink strategy is jointly owned by the Nutrition Steering Group, which looks after patient meals, the health and wellbeing group, which looks after staff health, health, and the sustainable development group, which looks after sustainability across the whole patch. The requirement to have a food and drink strategy for English hospitals was added into the NHS standard contract. So these are the terms that all hospitals uh, must meet in order to to be paid by central government, and. 
standard contract section 19 for food standards states that hospitals must develop and maintain a food and drink strategy but it must follow the hospital food standards report guidance must have regard to wider food standards guidance and when procuring we must include terms to revise healthy eating and drinking options and to adopt the government buying standards. And I'll talk a, a little bit more about the government buying standards in a while. A, a year or so after the hospital food standards report came out, we were approached by a local, um, a local group that work on health promotion that, that are based in Liverpool. And they wanted to do a report of vending across different hospitals in Merseyside they looked at um, what foods and drinks were available, um, where they were cited, the health impacts of that, and, and the cost implications as well. That really helped to drive us to look at vending as part of the wider hospital food standards. We've worked with partners over the last few years and looked at a few different alternatives, as well as the vending for snacks that are on every floor for each ward. We also have a 24-7 vending village and for that we've looked at healthy vending machines, the provision of fresh salads, and there was also a suggestion to look at when new patient meals are available to our patients, whether they should be available as meals through the vending village for staff. The idea of that was that staff would appreciate the quality of the meals that patients are having and it could bring some dialogue between staff and patients about new meals and get them more excited. The year after that, one of our consultant cardiologists worked with a medical student to look at the nutritional value of uh, food and beverage options within the vending machines, and this was just at the Royal Liverpool Hospital. This was before any changes had taken place, and um, hopefully you can look at the slide in more detail um, when the slide pack sent out. But you see that um, on the bottom left, that just over 75% of products were classed as unhealthy, so they had red labels for fat, saturated fat, sugar and salt. The cardiologist who'd done this report had looked through the the, quality, the calories that were available, the choice that was available, and the sales, so they actually got sales data. It wasn't just what was in the, in the vendor machine to look at, they used the sales data from our vendor to calculate the calories and the fat pro produced. From this, it led to a bit more work, and the cardiologist in question joined our Healthy Hospitals group. And at the same time, we got um, some national guidance, which really helped to drive things forward. So, national guidance is known as the Healthy Food Sequence. Sequence stands for Commissioning for Quality and Innovation, and it's a payment method in English hospitals to encourage people to go above and beyond the, the minimum requirements. Unfortunately, the, the funds that come with Sequence aren't then available to use for things like healthy food promotion, the top slice from the budget. So we didn't have a bonus of extra money to spend on health promotion, but it was still it was still a great drive and it was national, so we knew that everyone would be working towards it. The initial healthy food sequence came in 1617 and focused on um, foods high in fat, sugar and salt, so it banned price promotions on those foods and drinks advertisements in any of the retails and wider in the hospital, banned foods and drinks high in fat, sugar and salt from checkouts, and we had to ensure that healthy options were available 24-7, um, so for staff who work in shifts or nights, that they could have access to healthy food. Within our hospital organisation, all of our retail is outsourced. Um, the photos at the bottom show uh, Costa, which got rid of all sugar sweetened beverages, there was fruit, fresh fruit available in our um, Royal Voluntary Service site, and then fresh fruit and healthy snacks available at Great Smiths. All the retailers complied with this sequence guidance nationally, so it was very easy for us. We just relied on them to improve their systems. The following two years, the healthy food sequence focused on the percentage of drinks, confectionery sweets, and savoury snacks and what their calorie, fat and sugar makeup were. This is really useful because this now included vending with the previous sequence because it was focusing on advertisements and price promotions. It wasn't really applicable to, to vending, but this was, so it made it a lot easier for us to, to drive improvements. Again, we had 
emailed own letters of confirmation from all our on-site retailers to say that they'd met the requirements. In addition, we did an audit um, to provide further proof to our commissioners that we were meeting these requirements. So that was going around to every vending machine on our site, looking at the breakdown of the snacks, the drinks on them, trying to work out the calorie content content of them to pull together an order to show that we were meeting the requirements. The sequent 2018-19 was the last one for healthy food, but these requirements are now being added, added into the NHS standard contract, so it means that they'll remain valid going forward for all hospitals so we can be assured that standards won't drop. In addition to the sequin, there's also nice quality standards, so these are further standards that we have to provide evidence to. And the top one there is that adult cheese and vending machines in NHS venues can buy healthy food and drink options. This tied in very nicely with the sequin with its focus on healthy food available 24-7. So we were able to use the changes we've made to meet both the sequin and the NICE standards. In addition to working towards these um, government and central standards, we also started to work a lot more closely with partners. I talked briefly about working with Health Equalities Group and local doctors on our vending. We worked with public health on campaigns they've done. Over the last few years, they've had campaigns to save kids from sugar, so that's focused on cereals, drinks, and yogurts. We've had pop-up banners, you'll see on the right-hand side, that was something that we put out on Twitter, and they're mostly in the dental hospital, because um, sugar has a big impact on dental patients, and on some other particularly applicable clinics, so A&E and diabetes clinic, we use that. The quiz at Are You Sugar Smart was done in, in conjunction with Liverpool Free People and the Health Equalities Group. And that was us coming up with a quiz that we took to the local museum over the over the summer holidays and we're asking children to start engaging with the campaign as well. Following on from our work with local public health, we um, did a sugar trial at our Royal Voluntary Service sites. We had three sites that were part of the trial. And you'll see on the left-hand photo that they added high sugar banners to drinks that, that were high sugar sweetened beverages. Or you'll notice as well there's fresh fruit juice there, so it included natural sugars. The trial followed 10 weeks and used three separate venues. So they would add the high sugar banners for one week and then take them away from one unit and put them in another one so that they could track the sales and see if it made a difference. Overall, over the 10-week trial, we had the 7% reduction in sugar sweetened beverages, uh, but no loss in sales overall, so that was really useful. The interest in this was, was great. It was part of a behavioural insights programme that was run through Public Health and the Cabinet Office. And on the right-hand side is me being interviewed by Tokyo T TV, who came over to the UK to look at how nudge theory and behavioural insights were being used to improve health. These are some of the nice additional things that came about from our partnership working and linking into the UK government's requirements. The biggest driver overall, though, was looking at our catering contract. So in 2014, we started to review our outsourced catering contract, which includes some aspects of retail, all vending and patient meals. The initial, the initial idea was to use existing guidance, so rather than us come up with what we thought could possibly just be useful for the Royal, we followed national, national and local guidance on what we should use. So this included the Government Balance Scorecard, which I referenced earlier in the um, Hospital Food Standards Panel report, says that hospitals should give consideration to the Government Balance Scorecard. We used our local healthcare commissioner's social value strategy and then the Soil Association Food for Life accreditation. So that's something that within the UK is used as, as evidence that food is meeting certain sustainability and health criteria. There's a lot of interest in this. We were the first um, healthcare organisation in England to put in the balanced scorecard into a live tender. So that was an update of the government balanced scorecard. We were shortlisted through Procure Plus European Sustainable Procurement Network. I asked to talk at lots of different conferences, including the inaugural Agro Eco Cities conference in Zaragoza and Clean Med in Copenhagen, which is where I actually met Will for the first time, who's now Executive Director of Healthcare Without Harm. This is the 
local and um, Liverpool Healthcare Commissioner's social value strategy. We chose certain aspects of this, so this isn't the full social strategy by any means. We chose the ones that were applicable to the contract. So it covers economic well-being, things like good employment, living wage, and developing education skills and training for staff. Some social well-being goals, which look at how the contract could reduce social isolation, how it can foster healthy communities, and then environmental goals, which focus around active travel, carbon emissions, and minimising use of hazardous substances. Separately, there was the government buying standard. So this is an evaluation form that we created for the balanced scorecard. You see on the left hand side it covers five key aspects production, health and well being, resource efficiency, socio economic aspects and quality of service. The mandatory criteria in the second column corresponds with the government buying standards. So if all the people who are bidding for the contract could meet the mandatory criteria, we could show that we were meeting the government buying standards. The awards questions go above and beyond that. So there's some new sections in there. So you see um, supply chain management, inclusion of SMEs, which is small and medium enterprises, so that smaller businesses, local and cultural engagement, and employment and skills are things that aren't included in the standard government buying standards, but are in the balance scorecard. So this is what we've used to try and ensure that we exceeded the, the government standards. Because of the use of this, as I say, we, we were able to do presentations and apply for awards as part of the um, government's public sector food procurement implementation task force, which is looking at how more organisations can use the balance scorecard successfully, and also part of the hospital food standards panel now. So the 2019 review of the standards I'm able to feed into, and hopefully this this slide will be part of the guidance so that other trusts can look at how they're meeting the balance scorecard with their either in-house services or with their outsourced supplier. This is a document that looks at how assurance schemes link into the government buying standards. So there's lots of different tools that organisations can use to be externally credited to see how they're meeting the balance scorecard. It's, it's a very complex and long document and if you're doing it catering in-house particularly or vending in-house, there's so many different considerations that this is something that again may be in, in the new hospital food standards to show, what, um, show what's been going on. Now I'll just finish off with a quick update on some of the other things that we're looking at here in Liverpool. We've recently received £150,000 from Violia Environmental Trust, which is going to look at food growing at Broad Green Hospital, and this is being supported by the Incredible Edible Network, which is a, well, what it was a UK based, it's now a, a global movement for enhancing food growing and getting people involved. We were looking to be involved in a health foundation report to look at what makes the NHS an anchor institution. So this is wider social value and includes lots of aspects to do with food and, and with vending, so reducing the environmental impact, um, purchasing more locally and purchasing for social benefit and working closely with partners. So these are all things that we'll be doing over the next few years. And then in Liverpool there's a 2030 hub which is a local delivery body for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So linked into there we report on the UN Sustainability Goals and again hopefully as we go forward we'll get more details in that and it'll be clearer and with better KPIs. So that's a very quick run through for me. I think there are questions at the end uh, Maria so I'm happy to answer them when they come up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian, for your presentation. Uh, yeah, as you said, we will keep the questions for the Q&A session after David's presentation. Um, so now, uh, please, David, uh, the, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Paula, and thanks, Ian, for these interesting presentations and uh, introduction. So my name is David Irvine. I'm the Public Affairs and Communication Manager at the European Vending and Coffee Service Association. So I want to approach the presentation in three different parts. Firstly, I want to explain what, what vending is, what makes up the industry. I then want to talk a little bit more specifically about vending in healthcare environments and also some challenges around that. 
And then finally, I want to talk about more sustainable vending. So first of all, who are we as an association? Well, European Vending and Coffee Service Association was founded in 1994 in Brussels. So this year, we're actually celebrating our 25 years. Uh, we're primarily a lobbying association, the vending industry, with a lot of mostly technical legislation that uh, that we, we monitor and uh, try to put our positions forward in that. But we also provide a lot of industry information, both to our members and also to, to other stakeholders. And part of this is that we publish annually a market and detailed market analysis on 22 European vending markets. Uh, we also organize annually events and networking opportunities as well. So what is vending? We have well, over 4 million machines right across Europe. 80% of vending machines are actually in workplaces. Um, we have 10,000 vending operators. So these are, these are the, the companies that clean, maintain, fill machines. Uh, with regards to the operators, the market is hugely fragmented. There are many small operators, and even in some countries, vending operations um, is a secondary business, so people do it part-time, like in the evenings or the weekend, in addition to a, to a regular job. Um, so in terms of just the overview, we have some large multinational vending operators. We only have four of those, actually. Um, then there's large national vending operators, around 20. Um, some mid-sized national operators around 200, but the vast, vast majority, 9,700 or 9,800 operators, are really small local players, um, often running less than 100 machines. So essentially, the business in the most part is not a very profitable business, and it's on a very, very local level. Um, in terms of turnover, 16 billion euro turnover, and 85,000 people employed. One interesting statistic is that 250, 295 million consumers use a vending machine at least once per week. So everybody has a perception of what a vending machine is. Uh, normally it's very easy when you talk to somebody on the street and ask them what is a vending machine, they, they give you um, a very similar answer uh, because typically they know what a vending machine looks like from the train station or even from a hospital environment. But in fact, uh, hot drinks are our most common vending machine. Um, nearly two thirds of the market are coffee machines. And of course, they, they come in various sizes. The small ones are typically in office environments, but they sell coffee, of course, but tea, hot chocolate, and of course, soup as well. Another popular type of vending machine is a refrigerated vending machine. And of course, there's different types of these depending on what, what's being sold from solely cold drinks in bottles and cans uh, and the machines on the left-hand side through to machines that serve plated food and fresh sandwiches or snacks. And one of the most common types is the combi machine towards the right-hand side, which sells, as its name um, refers to a combination of all these products, so it's uh, much favored by operators. Turning to the most commonly sold products, as nearly two-thirds of our machines are hot drinks coffee machines, it's no surprise that 79% of the products dispensed are indeed uh, hot drinks. However, what could be surprising is in refrigerated machines, the most commonly sold item is bottled water. So that, that sometimes can be surprising uh, for people when they learn that. On the left-hand side, there's an example of a planogram. Um, this is just to help understanding of how food is placed into refrigerated vending machines. We can say that not every slot in a vending machine is, is created equal. Um, people, after various studies during, through the years, um, operators know that people tend to look at certain spots more often than they buy certain products from, from those spots. So here you'll see the, the red and the strong red part is the, the most commonly, um, is the most sold items uh, from those spots. So turning to vending in healthcare facilities, well, vending machines in healthcare facilities are included in our definition of public vending. Public vending makes up 20% of our 
industry. Um, so at most, we would estimate vending machines and healthcare facilities make up around 5% of our total business. Saying that, there's, there's absolutely a, a business need and there's benefits for vending machines uh, being in hospitals. For example, and Paula also referred to this, the only place open in hospitals very often is the vending machine after the canteen closes. So as a machine, it's open 24-7. Um, this provides a source of food and hydration for staff on those night shifts um, who yeah, want to eat a, a meal or a snack and sometimes just a, a boost just to get them through the night shift, but also for, for visitors and even um, patients. Importantly, for a healthcare setting, the machines are, are one of the, the most safe and hygienic way of uh, providing food. Two years ago, in 2017, the EPA published a report outlining legislation and guidance on healthier vending. Um, it didn't just cover healthcare environments, but also schools and workplaces generally. Uh, but the report outlined some interesting examples of best practices and, uh, and, and the way to go. We updated the report earlier this year, but it's currently out for review with national health um, representatives um, just before publication. However, you can still access the 2017 report for free from our website. So if you're interested, you can have a look uh, afterwards. So in this report, you'll see a summary table on the right-hand side. Um, the little H's here um, indicate where a country has either guidance or restrictions on products um, in a vending machine in a healthcare environment. So we can see that there's only, from our research, only around five um, countries across the EU where there's specific product or uh, machine requirements in healthcare uh, locations for vending machines. Uh, one example I wish to highlight is an example of Portugal, where Portugal introduced legislation in 2016 regulating what uh, what food products are banned from vending machines in their national health system. Um, the law is very very prescriptive, and there's a lot of lot of food um, categories and types that are that are listed that are not allowed in vending machines. Um, for example, cakes aren't allowed. Uh, sandwiches are allowed, but if they contain mayonnaise or ketchup, they're not allowed. Um, sweets, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, water has to be included as part of the vending machine contract, which um, as the most sold item in the refrigerator, the vending machine is not an issue, and the sugar level dosage is also regulated. The second example I wish to use is the healthy, healthy vending policy of the Irish Health Service, um, where they defined products that can be sold in vending machines as either better choice or other choice. So the current ratio for, for products is 60% better choice and 40% other choice, but of course this can be revised upwards um, by, by local management without any problems. Uh, they also make a reference that, for example, in pediatric hospitals it could be um, advised to have 100% better choice items uh, in the vending machine. Why this policy is also quite interesting is that signage has to be placed on machines to encourage, encourage consumers to choose the better choice items, um, as well as calorie information has to, has to be provided ahead of purchase. And going back to the planogram that we talked about a little bit earlier, the better choice items have to have the prime locations in machines, um, with the objective, of course, to make the healthier choice the easier choice. Uh, why we also like this policy is that it doesn't fully restrict um, all products or certain products, but it helps nudge and educate the consumer a bit about which products they should be eating. Um, one other thing we like about this is that this policy was um, designed by health professionals, but also in, in collaboration with uh, input from vending operators. So it's uh, something that was decided to gather for, to ensure that it's a, a realistic um, approach. Recent uh, initiatives as well from, from our side, where we've been a founding member of the EU platform for that physical activity and health for yeah, over 10 years. 
Um, so we're committed to encouraging healthier vending as, a, as an organization. Um, perhaps uh, I'm, I'm sure attendees already know this platform, but it's a mix of industry and NGOs committing to work to reduce um, the obesity crisis and obesity rates. The platform itself is currently under review, but the new commission could restart either this platform or introduce a new um, a new forum with uh, sim similar goals. And of course, as an organization, we would be very interested in continuing with that. One uh, initiative last year uh, we did was to agree with um, vending machine manufacturers that hot drinks machines will be configured in factories with zero sugar as default. So manufacturers typically set up their machines in a factory to ensure the highest quality coffee can be dispensed. So that's often they get a uh, coffee expert to, to set up the machine in terms of grind and ensure that's optimized, but also in order to reflect what is believed to be consumers' taste over years, part of that configuration may be that as default some sugar is in the coffee. We agreed, therefore, that the sugar would be defaulted to zero. So when operators receive their machines from the factory, um, the, the machine has uh, zero, zero sugar um, in the coffee choices. That's not to say that operators can't change that. Of course, they can change all the settings on the machines whenever they like. But for us, this should absolutely reduce unexpected sugar intake. I mean, I'm sure we have some examples where we, we've had a coffee from the machine and um, without realizing there's sugar in it, um, but it's really too late when it's dispensed, this initiative should should stop that. We also work closely and support our national association members with initiatives on a national level. And I'll just outline two very quickly. The French Vending Association promotes a feel-good label, it's called, which can be placed on vending machines where four different food categories are included within, and there are things like fruit and vegetables, and cereal products, and milk products. In the UK, the UK Vending Association uh, recently asked the British Association of Dietitians to publish a report on healthier vending, and they, of course, disseminated those results to members to, to encourage them to take action um, uh, with regards to healthier vending. I think this type of engagement should be encouraged. Uh, spending should absolutely continue to be proactive with uh, and work with health professionals in order to find a, a most suitable product choice, particularly for the healthcare setting. And just to bring some context to, to the situation as well, a company, or in, in this case, a, a hospital or a healthcare health facility, has the ultimate decision which products are placed inside the machines. There's a, a perception or a belief that when you have a vending contract, it's the operator who decides which products are placed in it, but it's actually the company and uh, the products that are placed inside the machines are decided at the contract tender stage. So um, we would advise that hospitals consult uh, closely with operators to see um, which products are, are feasible inside the machine and even specify which products they wish to be placed there. Uh, for us, a refrigerated vending machine is essentially a small shop, so the vending operators can adapt the product offering to essentially the custom um, the client's wishes. Uh, Paolo referred to earlier the new green public procurement criteria from from the EU. These guidelines refer to organic products and things like that, but that's essentially not a problem for vending operators because. Um, if that's part of the, the catering contract, they can supply whatever products are required. So that is something important to keep in mind. However, one important principle for us is that vending machines should not be treated any different to other providers, i.e. the canteen. For us, to, it makes absolutely no sense if, um, say, soft drinks aren't allowed in vending machines in hospitals, but the canteen is allowed to sell whatever products um, they, they wish. So. And further to this, a ban in vending machine is obviously a, uh, a policy choice that we couldn't support. There are some challenges um, that we face in terms of uh, more diverse product choice as well. There are technical limitations to what products can be placed inside the machines. Most of the refrigerated vending machines are spirals, 
um, and there are specific sizes that a product has to be to in order to fit inside that, that spiral. Some products also can't fall. Um, with regard to perishable products like fruit, um, apples are potentially possible along with bananas, but it depends on the 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 visit situation and the footfall of the vending machine because for that and for fresh sandwiches you need an operator visits every single day and if there's lower footfall there's going to be um, less operator visits and um, so therefore it's not appropriate to put in perishable foods or fruit. Um, unlike normal retail we can say Vending is slightly different. You can't lift up a product, uh, have a good look at it, read all the information, see if it's uh, see if it's tempting. And for that, we know that vending consumers like familiar products. So um, we say vending is really a good guinea pig. New healthy products that, that consumers aren't familiar with, perhaps, it's not a good idea to put those immediately into uh, a vending machine. Other challenges are, we see it uh, all the time. Uh, people have the perception that all vending machines are unhealthy. And for us, that's, uh, that's absolutely not fair. And it's, uh, it's an outdated perception as well. Um, but it goes back to, I suppose, the, the industry setup where everybody sees the, the vending machine in the train station um, and presume that all machines are like that. Uh, but I can assure you, vending vending is indeed changing, um, and changing for for the better. Sometimes this general perception in people's head leads to to a vicious circle because then consumers wish to go to a vending machine because they think they can get a chocolate bar or a soft drink, whereas yeah, so that that continues this this circle that operators then continue to place. Um, calorie dense products in vending machines. Further to this, we have evidence from vending operators that they have put in a lot of healthier products, more diverse products into their machines, but um, they go unsold. So while surveys often uh, tell us that consumers wish to have more diverse products in vending machines, once an operator places them there, um, often they, they, they're not sold very well. And so it comes down to a tricky business situation for the operator. Um, of course, he wants to continue to have a profitable business if possible, but he also knows which products sell well. So it's, uh, it becomes tricky. As mentioned at the start, most operators are very small, very local. They aren't members of uh, an association, whether you're on a European level or a national level, nor come to events, nor have um, information from associations, so it's very, very difficult to get industry-wide pledges um, and to, to reach um, most European vending operators. We can say we have very little contact with uh, 8,000 to 9,000 vending operators across, across Europe, um, so that's also difficult. Turning to my final couple of slides, it's on sustainable vending. So over the last 10 years, there has been significant um, decreases in energy consumption of vending machines, um, mostly due to the fact that we introduced an energy measurement protocol in, in the EVA, where manufacturers can test their machines, and therefore that has encouraged them to um, reduce the consumption of their machines over the last 10 years. I'll reference things like LED lighting and smart devices. These are already implemented on the new vending machines. So, for example, uh, at, the, at the end of the evening when, when less people are using the machine, the, the vending machine can go on to sleep mode and then um, kick back in when somebody comes to, to the machine to buy something. Of course, there are the restrictions in that as well, because if you have perishable food, then the machine can't, of course, um, um, it has to continue to cool at the same level. Now we have eco-design energy labeling regulations for refrigerated vending machines, and that will undoubtedly continue the energy improvement that we've seen. Um, one important thing to note is that when energy labeling kicks in in 2021, the best vending machine is expected to be an energy class B or an E.
so that's uh, that's really important because I know, for example, government buying standards in the UK require machines to be a B or higher, um, so that will need to be updated as well. Other innovations, large touchscreens are now placed on new machines to provide things like nutritional information on products um, so consumers can see that before they, they purchase. As always, there, there's some limitations because if the machine is completely by itself um, or outside, then there can be a risk of vandalism, so an operator is less inclined to use that. In a hospital, it's a much more controlled environment, so, so that's um, absolutely possible. Also, some companies have developed uh, mobile applications with similar functionality, so this can help the, the consumer decide the calorie content or the nutritional profile of the products before they purchase. And we are indeed aware of companies who specialize only in healthy vending, so that's a good sign. My final slide touches on the EU Single-Use Plastics Directive. We know it will require a significant reduction of paper and also uh, no plastic and also paper cups, especially with a plastic lining. Um, what people don't often uh, realize is that hot drinks machines can allow a consumer to choose their own cup as well. Um, and you can see in the bottom right a sticker developed by our German Vending Association colleagues to encourage people to, to bring their own cup. It does depend on the location because it's, it's easier maybe on, on back office or for staff to bring their or use their own cup at a machine, but for, um, for a visitor to a hospital, it's not, it's not always appropriate. So what we would say is that in a closed environment like a hospital, people tend to consume a coffee or a drink in the building. And so we would advise, for example, that bins for, for cups could be specified in a contract with a vending operator um, to ensure collection is as high as possible. So that brings me to the end. I'd like to thank you and I hope you find that interesting. I will hand back now to Paolo, who will take the, the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, indeed, uh, this is was uh, really insightful. Um, I just want to remind you all that uh, this recording and present presentations will be available after a couple of weeks. Uh, but now we actually got uh, some questions, so we are going to try to address them, at least some of them in this short time. Um, uh, Ian, David, uh, you both mentioned actually the sustainable development goals, and I was wondering uh, if you could maybe develop more uh, the linkages between the machines and the SDGs. Hi, yes, yeah, so we reported on the sustainable development goals for n a number of years now. Um, initially, looking at the, the 17 goals and how we meet them, last year we looked in a bit more detail at some of the applicable targets that sit within the goals and hoping with our next strategy to identify some KPIs so that we can report on how we're working towards the targets for 2030. There probably won't be any specific to vending because it's such a small part of our impact. We'll be looking more to do with things such as apprenticeships and work experience placement, some work we do with patients with HIV, things we do with research and, and obviously energy and, and water use. So we'll come in there but I'm not aware of other than generic targets regarding healthy food, there's nothing specific to vending that I could pin, a, pin an action on. Excellent. Thank you, Ian. Uh, yeah, uh, there is nothing on the SDGs on, on many machines uh, directly, of course. Uh, but yeah, it's good that you highlight some um, things with health and also some environmental points. Um, actually, uh, Ian, um, Denise Connolly, um, Thank you for your presentation. And actually, um, 
he is wondering as well if you could give us an idea of the impact of healthy food policies such as the NHS England screen that you have presented uh, have on the levels of food waste arising. Right, okay. Um, that's a great question. Thanks, Denise. Um, the, the Hospital Food Standards Panel Report that's meeting at the moment, um, I'm part of one of the subgroups of that, which is actually sustainability procurement and food waste. So food waste should be specifically included a lot more when the new new guidance comes out in um, sometime early next year. Don't, we don't have an exact date yet. So it comes within the balanced scorecard. So um, that includes resource efficiency, so there's a section on there on on waste. And there's also the aspects around the, that we've been looking at particularly about how patients access food and the shorter the time between them ordering food and eating, the less food waste there'll be, there's less chance that they've moved to a different ward or they've gone for an x-ray or they've been discharged. Regarding the bending, the healthy food probably doesn't particularly help with food waste because when vending machines are full of crisps and fizzy drinks then they can stay there for quite a long time and we do have a vending machine in our accident and emergency that includes pre-packaged sandwiches and some fresh fruit and obviously there's more risk there with, with food waste so it's a bit of a balance between what we can do to ensure people have access to healthy food, which often is more perishable against um, things that will last a lot longer but possibly aren't quite as good. But definitely food waste will be a bigger section within the new hospital food standards guidance, so that will be something that people will be asked to include within their next food and drink strategies. Thanks. Thank you, Ian, uh, for your response. Seeing uh, Owens is actually asking as well if actually vending machines uh, can be healthy and if there is any evidence base uh, for their inclusion in the hospital setting. Um, maybe, David, you can ask this question. You can answer this question, sorry. Yeah, no, thank you, Paolo, and thanks for the question. Um, yeah, as, as mentioned during the presentation, for us, a refrigerated vending machine is essentially a shop. It can, it can sell any product that, uh, that's required to be in it, but that's not an issue. So when you say healthy vending machine, yes, of course, it, it depends on the products that are placed in it, and it's up to essentially the hospital or healthcare facility to decide which products are placed inside the machine. Um, so yeah, there, there's no there's no issue there. In terms of evidence for, for placing a vending machine in a hospital, I, I referred to things like without vending machine, there'd be no no provision of, of food or drinks in hospitals outside of the canteen opening hours. Um, and yeah, so there needs to be some something open there to provide food for staff or visitors, um, and the vending machine vending machine can do that 24 hours a day. Um, if I was being a little provocative, I could say um, what you know. That I could ask the same question with regards to a canteen because uh, for us it's the same principle. Um, it, you know, if there's evidence for a canteen, if there's evidence for a vending machine to keep those opening hours uh, longer. Yes, uh, because actually there is any country or individual hospital that you know uh, that do not allow vending machines? We have no, um, with no evidence or, or no research indicates that vending machines are banned from hospitals. Um, as mentioned, there there are some countries that restrict um, the products inside, whether that's vending specific or whether that's as part of the, the whole catering contract. And that's something, of course, we would support. Um, on other countries, I suspect it's more on a local level, level um, possibly from from uh, hospital to hospital, but certainly on uh, on like a national level, we don't have anything else. 
um, and we have no we have no uh, evidence that vending machines are banned in hospitals. Yeah, uh, personally, I don't know any bank as well at hospitals. Uh, it's true that I do agree with you. There's some restrictions in some countries. And then as well, uh, what I realized is that uh, some countries as well just have uh, kind of vending machines that just on their canteens as well. Uh, so no, mostly in the corridors or at the entrances. So it's more like another part of the food provision, let's say. Um, another question actually um, is from Gladys on how will we solve uh, issues with cut fruit in cuts in the machines? Uh, so I guess like this is more like, as you mentioned, David, uh, uh, for some fruits it's not really good to include them in the vending machines because uh, they are reusable products. Uh, but in the other hand, like we could have as well this trade of like to provide more food, uh, we will have to use as well more packaging than more uh, produce more waste in that way. Exactly. Fruits, uh, fruits a little bit harder um, to be placed in vending machines also because of the irregular shape. It makes it a little bit more technically difficult, but certain fruits are, are fine. But then it does come down to that, um, that uh, operator frequency of visits if uh, he needs to come every, uh, well, very frequently in order to, to ensure that the, the fruit stays fresh and that people um, are buying it. So one solution would be for a hospital facility to to ask for fresh fruit in vending machines um, and on a trial basis see how it goes, but also it is related to the footfall, how often the vending machine is going to be used, which will determine the rate of visit um, and therefore it, it's, all, it's all linked to that. But as a principle again, it's uh, it's it's possible, it's possible, and uh, yeah, particularly in hospitals, we 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 would like to see that. Yeah, I also think it's possible. So, <laughs> uh, just uh, maybe one last question as well uh, for you, David, and then we will close. Um, is is there interest in the vending machine industry to provide more information to consumers of the planetary health cost of their products? Like, for example, uh, in terms of food miles, uh, freight rate, enterprise involvement in the production, etc. Um, it depends. <laughs> it depends on which market. We know that, for example, in Northern Europe and particularly in Scandinavian countries, there's much more demand for um, fair trade products um, or organic products and things like that. So it does de de uh, depend from market to market. But what we can say overall, there's much more of an interest from consumers to know what they're, they're getting in their product and, and therefore as the vending industry, we, we are trying to provide more nutritional information to, to consumers ahead of purchase because that's, that's what they're looking for. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, at the end of the day, uh, we are all consumers, so I think we should all uh, be informed actually to take the best decision. Um, I actually would like to conclude uh, with one idea uh, that is that uh, vending machines uh, should not be treated uh, different, differently than other uh, food services. Um, so please, um, to all organizations, uh, just uh, set the ambition to actually create a sustainable food policy and action plan. And also, uh, don't be afraid to establish a dialogue with your supplier in order to improve uh, which products are placed inside machines and also their environmental performance. 
as a whole. Um, I am sure like you could achieve actually great benefits from that. And yeah, Ian said like every small action counts. So go for it. <laughs> um, thank you very much uh, to all participants and to the speakers for participating in this webinar. Uh, please do not hesitate to contact us if you have any question or to share your experience in the European healthcare sector. It's always great to hear from you. So thank you again and have a nice day.